You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. Man, we are here once again today. Man, we have another amazing show lineup for y'all today. Man, we have an amazing guest. He's a youth motivational speaker, Eric Daddario. He has an amazing website. You should go check out the decisionswemake.com. He does amazing work for youth, and it's a great honor to have him on the show. And first and foremost, man, Eric, thanks for taking time. How are you scheduled, man? How are you doing? Great. How are you? Man, all is good, man. So you have a, a pretty awesome story, a powerful story. Before we dive into what you do for the youth and, and all the great traveling you do to inspire them and to help educate them on this uh, topic, kind of touch with the audience a little bit, a little bit of background story of you. Yeah, for sure. So about 15, 16 years ago, well, no, actually, let's say about six years ago, you know, I'll never forget when I was in my brother's hospital room and the doctor walked in and he goes, I'm so sorry, but you're going to have to say goodbye to your brother. You're going to have to. And then he looks at my parents and he said, and he says, you're going to have to say goodbye to your son. And I'll never forget those words and how they made me feel and how they made my parents feel because my brother had just overdosed on heroin. And he was in a coma. He was on life support. And this all started when he was in middle school, when he was in high school with the decisions that he made, making the choices to drink alcohol, making the choices to smoke weed, making the choices to mess around with the Percocets and Oxycontin, because like so many youth today, he was struggling. And specifically, my brother, my younger brother, Brendan, that was his name, Brendan, he was really struggling with social anxiety. See, because for Brendan, he, he was so nervous, so concerned, so afraid of what others thought about him, of what they'd say, of how they react. And that just, that held so much weight in his life and he cared about it so much. And so not knowing how to deal with the social anxiety, this tough moment he's going through, he starts making those decisions to numb, to dull, to mask his pain, thinking that's what's going to help him. That's what's going to help get him through this tough moment, but not knowing, not realizing that he's only pushing his problem to the side. And so he finally realizes that, you know, drinking, it's it's not going to help me. This this is only hurting me. So that's when he starts smoking weed because now he thinks, well, this weed, it's going to help calm me down, relax me, make me feel better. But then just like the alcohol, he realizes, nah, it's only making it worse. See, I feel better in the moment when I'm high. But then when I come down from that high, I feel like I did before. All that pain, that suffering, that struggles come back. So then he decides, all right, I'm going to stop messing around with the Percocet, the Oxycontin, the Xanax. And because he was, you know, because he had drank, smoked, and made those choices, and he wasn't able to deal with what he was going through in a healthy way, well, then Brendan starts shooting heroin. And he would go through that vicious addiction of heroin for about 11 years, 12 years. And that just started the spiral that really, well, I mean, it started before that, but that just, it was, it was a horrible thing to see him go through. And so going back to that opening scene of being in the room with the doctors, I said to myself, after I heard that, and we had to say goodbye to Brendan, I processed that for the next few days. I said, what could have made a difference in his life if he had done something different? How could he still be here today and not dead? And I thought to myself, if he had made healthier choices, if he, at the beginning, you said we're going to talk about speaking up and asking for help, well, right there, if he knew, if he had education on how to speak up, how to ask for help, who to approach, how to approach them, what to say when asking for help, if he had just made better, if he just made healthier choices, then I just firmly believe he would be here today. But I also firmly believe that if we can get our youth to make healthier choices, if we can get our youth to do things like speak up and ask for help when they're struggling, then we can we can really help this whole epidemic of drug addiction, of suffering, of anxiety, of depression, of suicide. So 
I started on this mission to talk to high school, middle school, and college students, but also athletes about making healthy choices, about how to ask for help. And that's where I am today. This is our Refocus Radio We're talking to our guest, Eric Daddario. And man, when you were working with these young people today, are there signs that you kind of help with, you know, adults and parents who can kind of see and notice some red flags, if if you will, that maybe uh, a young person needs help, but they may not be speaking up right away? Yeah, sure. And again, everything, it's 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 hard and it's interesting because people are affected in different ways. So they may have different signs. And when someone's going through different struggles, because there's plenty of struggles out there. I talk about a lot, addiction with drugs, alcohol, self-harm, anxiety, depression, but there's so many other things out there like eating disorders, right? So there's, there's a lot of signs, but I think the big signs, number one is, is they get disinterested in something they love. So let's say, for example, their son, their daughter love to play hockey. They all of a sudden are just like, I don't want to play it anymore. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not interested. I don't even like it. Another thing is, is their appetite. They're not really eating that much. They, they've, they've stopped eating. They're sleeping a lot. They're, they're, they're just acting in a way that you haven't seen them act before. And there's plenty of other things uh, of signs when they're struggling through these types of things. But I think that those are those are the big ones right there. And I always say to parents, I can sit here and I can I can stand here and I can tell you all the signs that your son, your daughter will go through. And that's important to know. But you know in your heart, you know deep down, you have that that intuition of a mother, of a parent. Something's wrong. And when you have that intuition, most of the time, you're right. You're right. A lot of times, it's funny, a lot of parents will tell me, you know, I thought something was wrong, but I didn't do anything. I just was like, shook it off. And I think it's important that we listen to ourselves because I really feel like as parents, we know our kids. And when we think something's wrong, we shouldn't just brush it under the rug and keep going and say, he or she's fine. Because nowadays, you just never know. So I would say, yeah, it's important to know those signs of, they lose interest in something that they may have loved. They're not eating a lot. They're losing weight. They're sleeping a lot. They may be acting out in a way you're like, this isn't my son or daughter. Those are important, but it's important to listen to yourself, to listen to that intuition that you have, because as I said, a lot of the times, it's right. And for the young people, when when they are struggling and maybe one is listening to this show, this episode in particular, what based on your real life experience and, and what you do when you're traveling and talking to these young people, what are some good steps for them to take for them to to take that action to ask for help and instead of trying to ignore it and do it by themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. Before I get into the three action steps I talk about, whenever I go and I give that talk of asking for help, I really break down the barriers because this is so hard to do because there's so many barriers out there. There's so much stigma about asking for help. A lot of times, especially the males, the men, they don't ask for help because they've been brought up. We've been brought up in a society that if I'm a man, I'm supposed to be able to get through it on my own, regardless of how hard, regardless of what it is. A man is supposed to be tough. It's supposed to be strong. And they're supposed to be able to get through whatever it is he's faced with. He shouldn't need help because if he does need help, that's a weakness. And if it's a weakness, then we're looked at as not being strong. And I would say that, you know, the females, they don't have that exact same attitude. With them, I think that they're just really nervous. They're concerned and afraid of what others may think of how they may react. Now, I'm not saying the males won't have that attitude. But I think the females weigh a little heavier on that. And the males, a lot of time, weigh on, I'm a man. I need to get through this. So it's important we understand, first off, that this conversation, it's hard. It's not an easy conversation to have. And it doesn't matter how tough you are, how much weight you lift, how strong you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are, where you come from, the amount of money you have, everybody. And when I say everybody, I truly mean everybody struggles to have this conversation. So it's important we realize that, that A, 
it's not a weakness, it's strength, but also B, that this conversation for everybody walking this earth is hard. So now we can get into three steps to take. So when you're struggling through whatever it is you may be, you will, or you know somebody going through something, the first step is who? Who should you approach? Who's the best person to approach when you're having this conversation? And we talk about youth. There isn't a right answer. There's not one person you must. You know, it doesn't have to be your teacher. It doesn't have to be your coach or your parent. But I always say it's an adult you trust. That's the best person to approach because this conversation, as I said, isn't easy. And when you're able to approach someone that you trust to have the conversation with, then it makes it a little easier because it, it's, I always tell the kids, it's not going to ever be super easy to where it's not difficult. It's not hard. But when you have an adult, you can trust to have the conversation. It makes it a little easier. And on the side of that, when you have this conversation with the adult, if you do decide to approach them face to face in person, then it's always a good idea, I believe, to grab a buddy, a friend, a classmate that you trust to be there to support you when you're having this conversation. Because when you have someone there to support you, to help you, to have this conversation, it makes it a little easier for you instead of doing it on your own. So that's the first thing. Who? Who should you approach? A trusted adult. Now that we know who to approach, how? How do you approach them? What's the best way to go about doing this? And again, it's, it's all determined on the way you want to do it. If you want to go and approach them face-to-face, -face, awesome. Approach them face-to-face. -face. Talk with them about what you're going through. But if you don't, if that's too nerve-wracking, too frightening, concerning, that's fine. You have their email, you can email them. If your friends on social media, then you can DM, you can text them. You have their phone number, you can text them on the phone, you can call them. But the biggest thing I always say to kids is it's important that you actually take this step and you take action on it and ask for help instead of not taking any action. And then lastly, what? What do you say? Now that we know who to approach and how to approach them, what do you say? when you talk with that person about asking for help? Well, when you talk with them face to face, you let that guard down, you become vulnerable and you just, you let them know what you've been going through, your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts. Because I firmly believe that if we don't talk about what we're going through, we keep it bottled up inside. It's like a Coke bottle and that you shake the Coke bottle up and you shake it up and you shake it up. And if you just continue to shake it up and you don't do anything about it, eventually when that Coke bottle opens, it's going to explode everywhere. So, you know, it's important that we realize to just let that guard down and be vulnerable and talk about what we're going through with somebody. But again, if you're saying to yourself, but I don't want to approach them face to face at the beginning. Okay. Well, if you DM them, if you write them an email, if you write them a text on your phone, it doesn't have to be a paragraph of everything you're going through. Just a sentence or two, letting that person know that look, I'm struggling right now. I'm really hurting and I need help. Can we talk? And it's just that simple. And then when you do get on the phone with them and you talk or you do meet with them in person after that email, that text or <clears throat> that phone call you gave them, then you can let that guard down, be vulnerable and really discuss what you're going through and how you're feeling. This is Aubrey Focus Radio talking to Eric Daddario and you can go to his website. His website is easy as the decisions we make dot com. Now, when you talk to the young people, what has been their feedback and are there also tips that you share with them how they can uh support their fellow student uh, classmates and if they see signs, you know, best ways that they can do to be a good supporter versus ignoring what they might be going through. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And the biggest thing for them will be to do one of the toughest things that you have to do. The thing that I didn't do, see, if we back up for a sec, and I can talk about my brother, when my brother was drinking, when my brother was smoking, when he was messing around with the pills, when he was shooting heroin, I knew he was doing it. Here's the crazy thing, though. I didn't say anything. Because I wanted him to like me. Like, how crazy is that? I, I shake my head when I think about that now. I wanted him to like me. I didn't want kids to, to, to think I was a snitch, to think I was tattling, telling on them. But if I had known what I know now back then, I would have said something. But I didn't. And 
I always think to myself, well, what if I had said something? Maybe he'd still be here today. So I think the biggest thing is, first, we got to approach him and we got to talk with them and then and, and see how they're doing and just let them know, look, I, it seems like you're going through a tough moment. What's going on here? And eventually, if they're not able to stop, I would say you got to have that tough conversation with an adult. Just like if I'm struggling through something and I approach an adult about what I'm going through, well, you got to approach an adult and let them know what your friend, that sister, that brother, that teammate's going through. You got to have that tough conversation. And I'll say this if you're a youth and listening, yes, in the moment, your friend, your sister, brother, they may be mad. They may be pissed off. They may, they may not talk to you for months. But I've heard of so many stories where that's been the case. And then the person reaches out and goes, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for looking out for me. Thank you for being a true friend, a brother, a sister, a teammate, and doing that because I am much better. And, and it's, it's, it's a large part because you had the strength and courage to approach an adult and let them know what I was going through. It's funny, though, because in the moment when people are struggling, they want to get help. They want to say something. A lot of the things that they do is a cry for help, but they just don't know how to actually say it. So they go in those ways of getting those cries for help in negative ways. So it's important that if we have somebody, we know somebody going through something, that we talk with them about it and that we talk to an adult about it and that we let them know that I have a friend, I have a brother, a sister struggling, I'm concerned, I'm afraid of what their choices can lead to, of the road that they're taking. I really care about them. They need help. So I wish there was an easier, better way to go about doing this, but that's the best way to do it. That's what's really going to help them. And I'll say this on the side of that. At a lot of schools, there's they have policies. and If you go and you talk to your principal, you talk to a teacher, a lot of times it could be an anonymous tip. So that person may not know it was you. They may know it was you, but they may not. So, yeah, that that can that helps a lot of times because a lot of people are afraid of what others may think about them. Yeah, I think that's key. A lot of people do kind of put that in the equation, being worried about what someone, you know, react to them or whatever. Now, when you get past that, are there experiences that you, you know, experience as far as traveling different schools where they have a, like a review, you know, like six months from now, you know, how that person's yeah, I, doing, I, are they doing better? I've had plenty of kids come up to me and say, I'm struggling. I have a friend struggling. And I have had people reach out to me and say, this person that you, you talked to after came to the counselor's office, got help. We knew she was struggling. Before you came in here, she wouldn't talk with anybody, but she was able to see the value in asking for help, but he was able to see how it didn't make him look weak, how, how it's actually a strength and how it's going to help him to get through what he's going through, how the choices he's making isn't helping, but hurting him. So there's been plenty of stories out there where I've gone to schools and kids have come up to me after, talk to me. And I've actually walked some some kids down to counselor's office, uh, dean's offices, assistant principal's offices, because they didn't, they were scared to have a conversation. And if I'm able to be there and help them to have this conversation and make it easier, and that's what I'm there for. So there's been plenty of instances where I've seen kids get help and just change their life. And one question I want to ask too, we recently, we all went through the pandemic globally. I can imagine uh, the conversations that you probably had with students who had to face that, you know, going to school in a different way, you know, via Zoom or virtually. What has been some of the feedback and some of the things the parents had to do to adjust with their kids uh, facing those challenges? I think one of the biggest things is getting them out of their rooms, right? So when they were in their rooms or whatever, wherever they were, if you even just say get them out of the house, get them some, some sunlight, get them moving, 
because a lot of people were being affected, as you said, tremendously by this. And those who had depression became more depressed. Those who had anxiety became more anxious. Those who were misusing substances were more apt to use more, were more apt to, or if they were in recovery, were more apt to relapse. So mothers, fathers had to get their kids outside, put their kids on a schedule, just keep them active. Try to, they were trying to make life, I heard a lot from parents, trying to make life as normal as possible, which was very hard to do for everybody, but they were just trying to get their kids as normal as possible. I mean, if, let's say a kid, he was, it was in the summertime and he was a basketball player. Well, father would walk down to the basketball court with him and shoot some hoops, or they would encourage their two daughters or sons to go down to the court and shoot hoops or go out and run on the track, just getting them moving, getting them to try to live as normal as a life as they were living as possible. But it was, it was, it was easy for those who were struggling to relapse in their self-harm and their addiction to drugs or alcohol, because what those types of people really thrive on, especially those in addiction as a community, is being around others, is interacting. And you weren't able to do that. So that's why it was so hard for those who were in recovery and those who were actively using to stay clean if they were in recovery and not go down that road. And for those who were struggling in the pandemic, it was hard for them to actually get clean because they didn't have that support group. They didn't have those people coming around who were supporting them, cheering them on, going to meetings in person. Yeah, we all found out the the computer isn't like in person, not at all. So those were the biggest struggles. We've been talking to Eric Daddario. Go to his website, thedecisionswemake.com. In today's topic, we've been discussing how to ask for help when struggling. And I feel like this can be, you know, students. It can be adults. I mean, anyone who is facing challenges, they can learn better how to speak up and ask for help. And we can all help each other uh, get through those challenges. You also work with athletes as well. and. I Sports athletes, I mean, they got pressured, right? They got to win those big games, but they also have to hit those books. What are some of the common threads that you've uh, noticed throughout the time you've been able to experience interacting with uh, student athletes as well? Here's the funny thing is maybe for different reasons. And I'm going to even say some of my heaven, I'm thinking of the same reasons as kids who don't play sports. It's funny, we put athletes on this pedestal that even pro athletes, especially pro athletes, but even college and high school athletes that, oh, they're an athlete. They're not going to go through anxiety. They're not going to struggle through depression. Then they won't become addicted to drugs and alcohol. No. So a lot of the things that I see when I go and I speak to students and not student athletes, just a group of students, I see a lot of the same things, anxiety, depression, substance misuse from drugs, from alcohol, self-harm, but for different reasons. So for the athlete, it's maybe at the college level, they're really anxious, they're really concerned, afraid that I'm not gonna play at that next level, right? I put so much time, I put so much effort into the sport that I play. And this is my identity, I put all my eggs in this basket. If I don't make this, what am I gonna do? And it becomes very, they feel a lot of anxiety or they become depressed because maybe they're not getting looks in high school to play at that next level or to play, they have these dreams, these aspirations, these goals of playing division one and they're getting offers, but they're not getting the offers from the schools they want. And social media, social media blows everything up so much because I talk about high school athletes and getting offers and stuff, but they may see their friends post on social media. That's a new thing is, well, not new, but that's what happens now when you commit to a school for any sport, you're going to put the logo of the school and you're going to say, I'm super excited to announce I've taken my next, um, I've taken the next step in my hockey and academic career to go play and attend school at such and such school. So other kids seeing that, it really hurts. Another thing too, you talk about the pressures of winning and stuff. At certain age levels, especially in high school, and I would say in college too, that parents are on you. Parents are on you because they've probably 
sacrificed a lot in their life for you to get to that point. So they're on you to play good. They're on you to get a scholarship. They're on you to score points, to be a good player. And that can be a lot of pressure, a lot of weight that you carry around. But I'll never forget talking to a hockey team, college hockey team, one of the best college hockey teams in the country right now, actually. And I was done. Kid pulls me aside and goes, Eric, you know, I'm really struggling because I'm, and by the way, this kid talking to me, I'm not going to mention his name, but you're going to see this kid in the NHL. If you, if, 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 if you watch hockey, if you watch pro hockey, someday you, I guarantee you this kid will be in the NHL because he's already been drafted. And so he walks up to me and goes, can we talk for a second? He just, we sit down and he looks at me and he just starts bawling his eyes out. And he goes, I'm just so nervous. I am so anxious because of this injury that I've been nursing that I've been trying to get right for the past two years. I just feel like I'm going to re-injure it. I'm going to hurt myself. And then he goes, oh, and by the way, my mother, my father, my mother, my sister, they're alcoholics. And that really consumes a lot of my life. So it's just important to realize that athletes are humans just like us, and they're going to struggle just like us. They're going to have things in their life that happen, just like that kid I just told you about with his mother, with his sister, that they're going to struggle with anxiety, depression, those things. So they're, yeah, they're different in that they may have a, a special skill set to be an athlete, but it's important we realize they're still human and they're still susceptible and they will struggle. Once again, been listening to Ari Fox Radio, talking to our guest, Eric Daddario, and you can go to his website, thedecisionswemake.com. I feel this was a very important uh, conversation to have for today. Someone listening right now, and maybe it could be a parent who goes to school, uh, what is the best way for schools or parents to reach out to you through schools to have you come and speak to students? Yeah, so I would say you can email me at eric at the decisions we make dot com. Again, that's Eric E R I C at the decisions we make dot com. All one word after the at. And you can go to my website, as you mentioned a few times, the decisions we make dot com. And there's a tab on the right, it says book. You can fill that out. That'll go right to my email and um I will get back to you as soon as I get that. So those are the two best ways through email and then through my website. Once again, man, I want to say thanks to you, Eric Dario, taking time talking on Refux Radio. Man, if there's anything else that we haven't uh, plugged yet, what would you want to call to action for our, our listeners to to take? Yeah, I would say this. Well, I, before I go into that call to action, I'd love to come back on here at some point and really dive into, because this is a big part of helping kids to get help and ask for help, really talk about parents' role parents' roles in, in this, because I think that if we as parents to our sons and daughters can do a better job of being approachable, then I think that that, that could really help them to ask for help. So I'd love to talk about that in another, another episode. But I would say this, I'll leave your listeners with this, is that know you're not alone. Know that everybody in their life through different stages struggles. And more than once, there's no one on this earth that doesn't go through struggles more than once. It's a part of life. So you can't run from the struggles. You can't hide from them. You can't avoid them. You must go through them. So just know when you're faced with these tough moments, don't push them to the side like my brother to make those unhealthy choices to try to numb and dull, mask that pain. Make that hard decision. Make that healthy decision. To speak up, to ask for help so that you can start living a much happier, healthier, more fulfilling life and live the life that you deserve. Be listening to Army Focus Radio. You can go visit Eric's website. It's thedecisionswemate.com. I want to say thanks again to you, Eric Daddario, taking time to schedule talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you.